Eschatology, Part 4 We said that for most of the Christian era, the last things had to do with the individual, what happens after death, and then secondarily with the end, when Jesus comes back on Judgment Day. But for the last hundred years or so, more people have recognized that what the Bible referred to as the last days actually began with Jesus' first coming. The Bible's first reference to it was in Deuteronomy 4.30, where it had to do with the time of Israel's restoration from exile. It was then that God would fulfill his promises to Abraham, namely that he would give Abraham's seed a land of their own, would dwell with them and to lead and protect them, and through them to undo the effects of the fall in the whole world. When Jesus came preaching the, that the kingdom was in their midst, he was ushering in what those promises were all about. In him the age to come had dawned, but there were times when Jesus talked about the kingdom as something that would come at the close of the age. It was both. He inaugurated it, but would have to come back one day to consummate what he started. For a time the world would be in an overlap of the ages. The era of the fall would continue even as the age to come had begun. Peter said that Christians could look forward to a salvation being readied for them in heaven to be revealed at the last time. And yet he also wrote to tell them that they were seeing what the prophets of old and even angels longed for. And that was what they already had in Jesus, who had been revealed in these last days. The already and the more to come both belong to us in him. If this is right, then the whole New Testament is an eschatological book. It's all about the last days, and we're in them. It's not just about some radical change in our environment that will one day change the world. It's about a radical change that has happened already in human history. The sun has darkened, the stars dimmed, the moon turned to blood, the Son of God killed but came back to life, to quote Peter at Pentecost. And it's about a radical change that has occurred in us. God has poured out his Spirit on men, women, children, and slave alike. Do we grasp it? Is it real to us? That which will come is part and parcel of what has come. But why hadn't Jesus consummated it on his first coming to Palestine? And what does it mean for his people during this period of the overlapping ages? Consider, for instance, an enigmatic bit of John's first circular letter. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. John here is talking about the commandment to love one another. It's not new. Yet it is, after all. Why? Because something has changed. The darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. Something new has happened. A new power has come which enables God's people to put it into effect. We're in dawn. A new day has begun. The old era is dusk. Its sun is setting, passing away. Verse 9. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause of stumbling. To which era do you belong? In which era are you living? Is there anyone you hate? That might be a clue. A new age has begun. The old is ebbing away. It's time to put all hatred away. In his gospel, John had said, I have come as light into the world, that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I have not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has a judge. The word that I have spoken will be his judge on the last day. For I have not spoken of my own authority. The Father who sent me has himself given me commandment what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. There's a new power at work in the world. One that can wake the dead. It has already made some spiritually dead come to life. 
and is transforming recalcitrant enemies into obedient sons and daughters. The commandment is new because it comes with new power, the same creative power that gave us life in the beginning. The new commandment to love, Jesus said, is really the prior primordial command, come again, live. Let there be light. Let there be love. As God's last day people, we are to be living proleptically out of the future, anticipating what that coming future will be in the present. That's our task and our privilege. But to do that, we need to have transformed minds and expectations. Do we know what's happened? Do we know who and what we are? Or are we still living as if nothing's changed? Are we still biding our time waiting to die to be with Christ? or for him to finally come back and rescue us? A new age is now. William Hendricks entitled his commentary on Revelation, More Than Conquerors. Well, that's the book we're going to be studying, not so much Hendrickson's, but John's. It was first sent to a few tiny little bands of Christians huddled together in the midst of an overtly hostile world. They needed its message. So do we. John's Apocalypse was written to tell them who they were. In spite of their circumstances, they were in reality an army through whom God would conquer the world, our promised land. It was written to us, too, to do the same. Do we know who we are? Do we have any idea what we can do? Those are the questions of eschatology as much as what will happen in the future. We're going to be looking at the end times prophecies in the Apocalypse. It's not that there are no such prophecies in the Old Testament or even in the rest of the New Testament. It's that the book of Revelation itself consists of all those same prophecies all rolled up together into one. There's very little new in it. Almost all of it comes from other places in Scripture, from Ezekiel, Daniel, Micah, Joel, Jeremiah, and from throughout the Old Testament, and from Jude, Peter, John, Paul, and Matthew in the New. Before we get into it fully, we should at least spend a few minutes talking about some of the eschatological positions that various Christian camps have held down through the centuries, some of the conclusions various schools have reached with regard to the end-time prophecies, and how they came to those conclusions. We're going to be trying on various shoes to see which fits the best. That metaphor is for the benefit of you ladies. You know that you don't just buy the first pair that sort of fits, men. We need to be more discriminating. These styles are listed in chapter one of your handout. What should be most interesting is that the three main schools are named for a term which occurs only a handful of times, all in a seven verse segment of Revelation 20, chapter 20. That term is the millennium and means literally a thousand years. Let's briefly re read that little paragraph in Revelation 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil of, and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into a pit, and shut it over and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received the mar his mark on their forehead or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such as the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison, and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle, their number shall be like the sand of the sea. And they marched up 
over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Okay, so here's the loaded text. The three main positions are named for the relationship of Jesus' second coming with respect to this thousand years we've talked about. Premillennialists think that Jesus' second coming will usher in the thousand years, after which he will reign on earth with certain saints. During this golden period, Satan's power will be curtailed until he has loosened at its very end to lead one final assault in which he will be defeated by fire from heaven and be resigned forever to hell with all his followers. And that's just what the passage says, right? Postmillennialists disagree. They feel that Satan is already bound and the church is even now plundering his kingdom. The task of the church is to extend Jesus' reign over the face of the globe, both by spiritual conversions and by ordering society according to Christian principles. God will extend his reign progressively through his church, and then Jesus will return bodily to put the finishing touches on it, to finally judge the world and usher in the eternal state. But there's also a third variant position that has come to be called amillennialism, or no literal thousand years. They don't believe in anything, right? No, it's not a denial that the thousand years mentioned here will occur, but that it's not a literal thousand year period of time, of literal rule, at least as usually defined. According to Amills, the millennium is simply another name for the last days we're now in. The millennium is now. Do we recognize it? Before we consider how and why these differences came about, let's also mention a fourth, which is really a modification of the first. Dispensationalism, developed by John Nelson Darby in the 1830s and popularized by Cyrus Schofield's Reference Bible, is an approach to scripture which divides history into seven dispensations, in each of which God presents man with a different test and deals with him on different terms. Dispensationalism has a premial eschatology in which Christ raptures the church out of the world at a time either before or after a seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation. Jews, or Jewish Christians, are left on the earth to evangelize. Schofield. The tribulation ends when the nations gather together against Israel in the Battle of Armageddon. Christ will return overtly to put down the uprising and establish his millennial rule out of Jerusalem. During this millennial reign, Satan will be bound and imprisoned, but loosened at the end to lead a final revolt. At that time, Jesus will defeat him, judge the world, and usher in the final state where Israel will dwell forever on the renewed earth and the church in heaven. Schofield. Note that in dispensationalism, Israel is always dealt with separately from the church, and according to some will enjoy an entirely different eternal destiny. As we saw last time, these differences stem from different hermeneutical schemes, different ways of understanding the text of the Bible, how words are used, and how they should be interpreted, not just in the Apocalypse, but throughout the Bible. According to Charles Ryrie, all passages of Scripture should be understood by the plain, normal, literal, historical, and grammatical method of interpretation whenever possible. In other words, if it can be taken literally, it must be taken literally. If it says a thousand years, it must mean a thousand years. On the other hand, end of the spectrum, Amils would ask, but what kind of passage are we dealing with? A plain, normal, literal, historical, and grammatical method of interpretation only works if the passage being examined is a plain, normal, literal, historical account. Is that what we have in Revelation? Is Satan literally a seven-headed red dragon? Does a scarlet whore literally sit on seven hills? Is Jesus a bloody lamb with seven horns and many eyes? Well, no dispensationalist would say that. Those descriptions are obviously word pictures, but a thousand years can mean that. 
a thousand years, and therefore it must. Well, must it? We talked about Jesus telling his disciples to beware the leaven of the Pharisees, and they began talking amongst themselves about bread. It could be taken literally, and they did, but they missed his point, and Jesus wasn't all that gentle in pointing that out. In the passage he said, O men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves and the five thousand and how many baskets you gathered? or the seven loaves and the four thousand and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to perceive that I do not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware the leaven of the bread, but the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees, or the equivalent in Mark's Gospel. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you do not have bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, and how many baskets of broken pieces you did take up? They said to him, Twelve. And the seven for the four thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, Seven. And he said to them, Do you not yet understand? According to Jesus, this wasn't just an academic deficiency, but a spiritual one. You have little faith. Your hearts are hard. Don't you have eyes to see and ears to hear? He expected them to just know when he was using figures of speech. But to follow Jesus' teaching, they would have to give up these little rules of thumb like, if it can be taken literally, it must be taken literally. But that was then. We don't have a problem with it now, do we? We know Jesus is talking about the teaching and example of the Pharisees, that it was affecting the whole community. Seeing that as Jesus' point isn't all that hard, right? So, what did Jesus' argument about the feeding of the thousands have to do with proving his point? Anyone? What do you think? What's that I hear people scrambling to find their commentaries? Understanding what Jesus meant is still sometimes a challenge. My own personal opinion, subject to change at any given moment, was that he was jogging his disciples' memory to recognize that pretty much everything Jesus did or said had a deeper meaning beneath the surface level, meant to engage the mind. The miraculous feedings weren't just about bread. Those episodes were about theology. Whatever else Jesus' parables and actions were about, they made people think. John's Gospel is particularly good at helping us discern the meaning of Jesus' actions and sayings. It's a book of signs and discourses. Perhaps the best commentary we can turn to to understand what Jesus meant in the feeding of the 5,000 is just to turn to John 6. He explains it rather well there. The point here, though, is that the Bible is full of poetry, metaphor, signs. And before we can grasp the meaning, we need to ask what kind of text we're reading. Now, what are some kinds of literature or things that we might read or examine and think about? Textbooks, bus schedules, poetry or allegories, art, newspapers, novels of various genre, fiction, nonfiction, etc., biographies, Satires, advertisements, April Fool's prank literature, Orson Welles' 1938 Mercury Theater Halloween broadcast of War of the Worlds, blogs and Twitters. When we read or study these, do we treat them all the same? No, we do so very differently, don't we? Once we figure out what kind of thing it is, we adjust. We come to them with different expectations, a different mindset. And we should. If we read an Aesop's fable as if it were a no-spin Fox newscast, we'd mess it up. Bad example. But what is the book of Revelation? Could we read it as if it were a history text, a history of the future, a newspaper that scoops all others? Well, that would be one possibility, and many have taken it. How about a bus schedule? a timeline of what comes next, and then next, etc. Well, again, it's a popular choice. 
How about poetry? Yes. Think of its imagery. Word pictures galore. Images that mean something. Pictures that symbolize or signify something. The objects themselves. Dragons. Beasts. A giant harlot. Fire. Thrones. What about colors? Snow white. Blood red. Dark. Light. Positions. Above. Below. Actions. Parallels and opposites. Similars and contrasts. How about numbers? Why not? What could the number three mean? Seven. Ten. Twelve. A hundred and forty-four. A thousand. A hundred and forty-four thousand. How about art? Could we see this book as an art gallery? I think so. In fact, here I think we're getting close. It is in words, but it's visual art nonetheless. Words describing scenes and images. John sees things and is told to write what he sees. In some scenes there are movements, like a pageant. A seven-act play, perhaps. Not only does this book contain pictures and symbols, but numbers extend to the structure of the book itself. The whole book is carefully sculpted with repeated patterns and interlocking parts. It seems to me to be a seven-part chiasm, each part itself a seven-part chiasm. If you want to get different perspectives on the book, just read different commentators. G.K. Beale, for instance, dealt mainly with the Old Testament sources alluded to in the book. It's full of them. It's essentially made of them. That's one perspective, and there are many others. Richard Bauckham's Climax of Prophecy is especially a study of its structure, so hopefully some of this will come out as we go. But as we begin, let's see if we can become comfortable with the notion that we should approach this book very differently from a Pauline letter or a gospel. We can't just assume that what we read will be literal statements that we should take at face value. Bread may not always mean bread. If anything, we should presume that we are dealing with things on a very non-literal level. This whole book is so obviously symbolic. Our safest bet might be to just assume that we're dealing with metaphors and look for most meaning under the surface. Why does John put it that way? How might God be using words and concepts differently from the way we usually use them? Most books of the Bible are not so much like this. This one is. Okay, a few final terms. How have certain schools pegged this book, what it deals with? What are some of the possibilities we should consider? One is futurism. That's a belief that Israel is to realize most of the promises made to her as a nation in the future, after the church has been removed from the earth. This comes, obviously, out of a dispensational approach. A futurist would just tend to see the book of Revelation from chapter 4 on as almost entirely concerned with the events just preceding Christ's second coming. On the other end of the spectrum, preterism is an approach to the apocalypse, which sees all promises to Israel as a nation as having been fulfilled in the first century AD. Thereafter, the church replaces her as the Israel of God. It is a theological opposite of futurism. A preterist might see the book of Revelation as dealing almost exclusively with first century events. Historicism is an approach to the book of Revelation which looks for its prophecies to be fulfilled in certain key events in history. An historicist would tend to see roughly a one-to-one -one correspondence between each prophetic figure and the event to which it refers. Virtually every generation since Christ has tended to see their own time as that referred to in the Apocalypse. The Reformers, for instance, tended to see the Catholic Papists as their chief oppressors referred to in the book, the Pope as the Antichrist. Preterism would be a particular case of historicism. There has been a tendency for every age to see itself and its enemies as the subject matter. We're no exception. David Chilton's Last Day's Madness asserts that these have all had something in common. They've all been wrong. Yet, could they not have all been right? Finally, idealism, a method of interpretation of the apocalypse which sees it as highly figurative, depicting the struggles between good and evil. 
Thus, its prophetic figures will not refer to any particular events of history, but apply to forces operative in every age. It depicts the character of evil and good and spiritual warfare, and the way each side does its warfare all down through history. Instead of asking who this beast is, or that figure, it asks what the symbols might mean. Here then is an introduction to some of the major positions with which we will be dealing as we give consideration to this topic of eschatology. I should reveal that my own bias is toward the Amil or idealist approach, if you've not already detected it. <laughs> 